So, uh, yeah, welcome here uh, for this uh, for this talk. And I really, um, it's a big pleasure for me to welcome here in Fontainebleau uh, Stein Olaf Henrichsen. We know us we know us since uh, quite a long time now. Uh, I have to say so. Um, uh, since our, my show on Edward Munch, uh, L'Oeil Moderne, or The Modern Eye, uh, it was in 2011 at the Centre Pompidou. And then, at that time, I think you were, uh, have just been appointed, I think one year before, at the, at the Edward Munch Museum. And we met um, then a lot, uh, as uh, the, our the show, uh, Edward Munch, L'Oeil Moderne, has two other ve uh, venues, so the show went to to the Frankfurt at the Schirnkunsthalle, and then to the late Tate Modern in London, and then, and it was really a supreme honor for us, you took it over at the Munch Museum in Oslo. And, uh, and then we are, st we are still now uh, still in, in contact for, uh, for loans, for, uh, particularly for a show on surrealistic art at the, at the new museum. At the new museum, that is really the key word, uh, because we are today we will talk uh, about the future about uh, how to expose, how to, to really to define a new policy of exhibition, uh, of Edward Munch's exhibition, and this new orientation, which goes together with a major uh, change and the major event uh, in Oslo, the opening of the new Munch Museum. And it's gathered in spring 22, if I'm, if I'm right, so in less than one year. So you feel okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, and you are on schedule? Yeah, that's great, because it doesn't happen so often. We're on schedule and uh, on budget, so we are very happy. Oh. <laughs> so I'm quite relaxed. Yeah, that's, that's very... And the collection did already move or not yet, so... Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very happy to be here. And thank you for coming. It's a really wonderful place. And now the weather is also turning very beautifully. So uh, uh, we had this collaboration in 2011. That was one year after I was uh, appointed to the director of the Elbert Munch Museum in Oslo. And uh, actually my background is from music and opera. So that was my first appointment uh, as a director of a museum and a single artist museum. Uh, and I think actually the first contract I did sign was with you at the Centre de Pompidou. So that was the uh, beginning of a very rich and uh, very, let's say, uh, active international program as well. So, so do you want me to say a little bit about uh, who we are uh, at the Munch Museum? Yeah, I think to present a little bit the collection of the Munch Museum, maybe it's not so known here. And then, of course, you have to present the new building. So that's uh, really uh, a big event here because I didn't... I don't remember having read something in the, in the French press on it, so it's, it's really new to see the pictures and the image of the new building. Well, thank you. There is actually a lot of uh, French uh, journalists visiting our museum also in Oslo, but uh, I can say a little bit about uh, who we are at the, at the Munch Museum. First of all, you have uh, this artist. This is a self-portrait from his uh, last home in Ekeli, outside of Oslo. And uh, as you see, he's... Uh, from 1863 to 1944. He's considered to be one of the founders of uh, modernism and, and certainly maybe the father of, uh, of expressionism and particularly German expressionism. Uh, and he was an artist for more than 60 years. So he was very productive. He has more than 40,000 artworks behind him. And uh, he started out uh, very early and uh, was uh, very dedicated to his art. He never established a family. He was uh, an artist for all his life. And uh, one thing I think is very astonishing with Edvard Munch is that he was also experimenting uh, throughout his whole life. And when he died, he was 80 years old. And the reason why he died was uh, that he, that was during the war in Norway and was uh, in the winter in January 1944. It was really cold. And the resistance movement had uh, had blown up an ammunition ship in the Oslo Fjord, and uh, this uh, was uh, lightning up the whole heaven. And Edvard Munch was running out into the winter in his pajamas uh, to to do drawings of these explosions. Uh, and then he got uh, pneumonia and uh, died uh, two weeks later. But uh, in those two weeks, he even managed to make uh, a work uh, on that uh, accident or incident, I would say. 
So uh, it's a single artist museum. It's dedicated to Edvard Punk. We'll say a little bit more about the programming because we're going to program a lot of artists. But uh, first, uh, a little bit about uh, what we have at the Munch Museum. Uh, when Edvard Munch uh, died, he wrote his uh, testament in uh, 1940. He was 76 years old, and the Nazis has just invaded Norway, and he was scared. Uh, he didn't know what the Nazis would do to him or his art, and he was uh, considered an entartet uh, artist, not wanted uh, artist, so uh, he was a bit afraid. And he had two thirds of his total production at his home at Ekeli. He collected everything. He didn't sell very much in the beginning of his life. He did uh, sell a lot of uh, works in order to to build an economy and to survive. But later on in his life, he sold very little. He did a few commissions, but a lot of uh, his later works is is uh, part of what he left at Ekeli. And that's very interesting because when Angela. Lampe came to the Munch Museum to do an exhibition on Munch and his relationship to, to photography. That was emphasizing the later period in Edvard Munch's uh, life. And, and that's not so much uh, known as the earlier period where you have all the, let's say, most famous uh, icons. The Scream, the Madonna, the Vampire, those are from the early period. And then later on he's continuing working on those works, but uh, still doing a lot of other very interesting work. So you can see at the Munch Museum we have uh, paintings, uh, drawings, um, we have uh, graphic uh, works, a lot of graphic works and sculptures, and then we have 15,000 page, pages of texts uh, left by Edward Munch. As, a, as a beginning of his life he was thinking even of being a, a writer. Uh, and then we have other museum objects, uh, we call it, which is his working tools. You can see here some painting tubes. We have uh, his uh, archive, we have his uh, library, and so forth. Yeah, that's very important, the archive and the library to for the research. research yes, it is very important to have the archive. And in fact, uh, we have uh, established a few years back a network of single artist museums. And one of the preconditions to be part of this network is that you have a collection, you have a museum, you have uh, research, and you have an archive. Uh, so, so this uh, is, of course, uh, very important activities uh, for us as well. So the city of Oslo received this uh, vast uh, collection in 1944 and started just after the war in 1945 to develop a new museum for Edvard Munch's uh, art, and this is the old museum. And in front you see Japanese uh, cherry trees, right? And that's because we have a very long-standing uh, relationship with the uh, petroleum company from uh, Tokyo, Idemitsu, and they've been us for 27 years and spend uh, more than uh, 11, 12 million euros on our museums. That's very good friends to have. That's why we have these flowers and they're going to come with us to the new museum. So this is one of Munch's uh, iconic works, uh, The Sun, and we put on that our vision. So our vision at the Munch Museum is to enrich the lives of peoples all over the world, people and peoples all over the world with the art of Edvard Munch. So this is a very important uh, vision in the sense that first of all we emphasize Edvard Munch, second is that we are enriching the lives of people and it's, it's uh, happening worldwide. So we have a very big international um, activity and I just wanted to show this, uh, this uh, piece from the Centre Pompidou and uh, I think Angela that's the reason why we had a half a million visitors to the exhibition in Paris uh, was that there was no more space because there was a line from the morning to night so there was no no more and I, I know that you wanted to have the exhibition a bit longer uh, but that wasn't possible because it was going to, to Frankfurt. Yeah because we were in the, uh, in the in the tour we had to go to Frankfurt and to London so everything was like uh, we were already very together. So. Very tight. Ah oui, pardon, pardon. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we w we there was an intention to to prolong the the exhibition, but it wasn't possible because we were in this very tight schedule. We had to go to uh, to Frankfurt at the Schirn and then to London, and so uh, and was yeah. It, it's it's always it's a pleasure to see the the, the people queuing in front of the Centre Pompidou, and uh, it was a big success. So yeah, we had um, more or less five hundred thousand uh, visitors. And it was even at the, at the Schirnkunsthalle uh, in Frankfurt, it was 
until today the, the most visited exhibition. It was less, it was around 220, almost 300,000 visitors. In the Tate it was a little bit less, it, it was during the Olympic Games uh, in uh, 2012, uh, but it was really a, a huge success and I just said in, my, in, my in the opening, so it was really a supreme honor for us to be that you took it over, so we, we, it, it was my colleague as well, so uh, Clément Giroux and myself, so we organized a major Munch show and uh, it w we were really uh, very proud to present it in, uh, in the Munch Museum itself, as foreigners. Uh, but of course all the works came from the Munch Museum in the first place. So we have a very uh, wide, uh, I want to say that we have a wide uh, range of exhibitions uh, internationally right now. While well, we are sitting here, there is a big exhibition in London, again, of uh, Munch's graphic works at the British, uh, uh, at the British Museum. Uh, and so we are in London frequently with exhibitions. And then we have an exhibition that opened uh, two months ago in Moscow, uh, which is 120 paintings from our collection. That, that uh, exhibition was sold out before it opened. Uh, and uh, now we are um, also having an exhibition, of course, at the Munch Museum. But two days ago, we opened an exhibition in this center for world culture in uh, Saudi Arabia. That's the first exhibition we do in an Arabic country, and it was a little bit controversial, naturally. But uh, this is a new art center uh, drawn from a Norwegian architect called Snøhetta. Uh, but it just shows that we can do exhibitions all over the world and in connection to our exhibitions we always uh, publish uh, works uh, and uh, texts in, in these languages uh, digitally and uh, also physically. So, uh, for example, in this case it's the first possibility for us to, to have uh, books uh, written uh, and published uh, in uh, Arabic. So that's also very interesting for us. Uh, one question: How reacted or how uh, the the Arabic uh, visitors to to Edward Monk? So that's what was one of my questions because I prepared some questions. So how is the reception? Because we just talk about this, or maybe we talk on later after the presentation of the new building. So it, I'm quite curious to to know how this. Oh, if if a monk is really uh, universal, or if there is some I don't know maybe some strange reaction in front of a monk's painting. Uh, no, I think um, he's universal in the sense that uh, he means a lot to, to people all over the world. And what I hear as a director of the Munch Museum when I travel around with these exhibitions is that that people feel that they learn a lot from from uh, experiencing Munch, and the Munch uh, uh, makes them more aware of uh, some of the aspects in their own lives. Uh, and I may may come back to that, but I think that uh, he's equally uh, observed. Uh, and loved all over the world in, in every culture. We just had an exhibition in Tokyo, which is coming back home now. And in three months, there was 690,000 people uh, for that exhibition. And the last day, we had 22,000 people in one day. So uh, some museums in Norway, they are very happy if they had 22,000 people during the year. But uh, this was in only one day. So I think uh, that uh, the thing that Munch is dealing with the existential aspects of being a human being is dealing not only with the darker side, with melancholy and jealousy and death and disease and that kind of very important and difficult uh, aspects of life, but also with love and friendship and nature. So he's actually dealing with everything that, that life is uh, involved with and all the decisions that you have to make and all the feelings that you, that you have and try to, to investigate and, and research and find out of. Uh, and this is the things that he's dealing with. But of course, he's a very good artist, so he's able to transpose those feelings and those uh, challenges uh, and those uh, experiences into real life and, and into more understanding. And on the other hand, I also think it's important that Munch has this very strong language that he developed himself. It's his own language, certainly. It's figurative, but still very modern, very vibrant, very powerful. And uh, sometimes it's even etching over to non-figurative uh, images. So uh, I think that people all over the world, even today, 70 years after he died, think that he's still a modern uh, expressionist, a modern artist, but dealing with a language that they can understand. 
and uh, also dealing with questions that concern them that are relevant to people everywhere uh, and also in a way that gives a deeper understanding. So in uh, Saudi Arabia, we just opened. I'm not sure exactly what the response will be there. I, I wasn't at the opening. I'm going next week. But one thing is for sure, and I believe that this is the first figurative art in Saudi Arabia since Muhammad. Uh, so it's a totally new experience. And we are doing a lot of uh, teaching and uh, and working on how we can uh, use this exhibition to create the reflection and understanding and knowledge uh, amongst children, amongst uh, other groups. So, of course, in every uh, exhibition we do internationally, we, we follow up with uh, catalogs, with uh, books, uh, with uh, digital information in their own language, uh, with their own artists, maybe sometimes, uh, writing about Munch. And uh, we also follow up with uh, very strong educational programs. So, for example, in, in this case, our educational people at the MOOC Museum has been working with, uh, with the Arabs in this center of uh, world culture uh, to develop uh, how can we use this exhibition to, to transpose uh, interesting um, uh, aspects uh, to this culture. Uh, was there a censorship or was there a few for on youths, for example? Or? Uh, were there uh, problems with censorship uh, concerning uh, uh, Edward Munch's nudes or some paintings of nudes, or, or was it not a problem? Uh, I think uh, in every country or every culture we are developing uh, exhibitions, you need to pay attention to the, to the culture and to how you have a dialogue with, with where you are. And of course you have to stay within uh, law. Um, and, uh, for example, we do exhibitions in China, in Russia, in uh, countries, uh, United States, everywhere. And we have to create exhibitions that communicate where you are. So to show nudity at this stage in Saudi Arabia is not possible, obviously. Uh, but it's very possible to create uh, reflection and understanding and knowledge. And, uh, of course, uh, it's also important to show art. Uh, and to support art and artists uh, in every country all over the world. So that's our task, is to, to show Munch and show artists and art all over the world, and also to, to participate in developing the art scene uh, locally. Okay, so that was just one or some examples from what we do internationally. We can take some questions afterwards, of course. But I just said that uh, we are doing a lot of other things. I'm going through it now, and you can have some maybe go into more of the... Uh, exhibition programming, but uh, we do very different exhibitions at the old Munk Museum, but we have only one venue, so in the new museum we're going to have more venues. So let me show a little bit about the new museum before we, we talk uh, further. We have an outdoor program with art around the town, uh, in buses, in uh, squares, in other places. So we can see the Munk Museum everywhere in, in our city. We have a lot of activities uh, at the museum for all kinds of uh, groups. This is for young people, uh, just at the Munch. And of course, for a lot of programs for children. Uh, and uh, very nice also environments for cafe and so forth. And we are very concerned with having a lot of uh, relationships to, to other institutions and, and uh, also the private businesses and travel agencies and, and other cultural institutions. So we have a lot of collaborators. And then there is uh, seven monk places, that is uh, places where monk lived and work that we also work very much with. And I just want to switch now very shortly into the digitalization because I'm saying at the monk museum that the biggest uh, transposition we are doing at the monk museum is not moving from one museum to the other, which is five times bigger than what we have today. The biggest transition at the monk museum is a digital uh, transition. So we have digitalized the collection. This is from the texts. Uh, and this is the new museum. So, finally. And uh, this is from the architect uh, Juan Herreros from Madrid. We're very happy with that relationship. And I'm going to go through some images and show you three minutes of an animation. This is how Oslo looked uh, at the waterfront when I grew up. And this is how it's going to look with the new town. And here you can see the big building in the middle. It's the opera. Uh, and then the tall building outside into the fjord is uh, its new Munch uh, museum. One word to the opera because 
This is made by the Norwegian uh, architect uh, Snu Hedde, and uh, we will uh, it's for the French public because it's uh, they are the architect for architecture for the new uh, building for uh, the journal Le Monde, and will open I think this uh, this fall. Uh, to get a, to get an idea for this really uh, wonderful architects and this building, uh, the opera, it's which is a, a really in a great elegance. On the floor, on the floor. Yes, the opera is on the floor. It was the first building in, in this part of the city, and there is uh, three million people walking on the roof of the opera every year. And this is now almost uh, also a PowerPoint of Snöheta because the the really really astonishing. Arabic building is also Snoheta, this one. This is Snoheta, and it's huge. Go into the internet and have a look at it, and if there was people in this page, you wouldn't see them because they would be too small. So, so they are doing uh, a lot of great work. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is uh, looking also from, uh, from uh, the new uh, city part. It's going to be 30,000 people living in this new part of town. And it's going to be there developed now, and the new Monk Museum will open next spring in May. Uh, and the opera has been there for a couple of years now, and it's also going to be some other art institutions in this area. So it's going to be, we think, a wonderful place to visit and to work and to, to live. Uh, and our museum is actually built on water with the oil technology. We have 320 piles going 60 meters down to rock. So we are, we are water on, on all sides. Okay, so the new museum will uh, be one of the largest single artist museums. It's 13 floors. We have 11 exhibition spaces, and we have uh, three places where you can drink and eat. Uh, there will be a wonderful studio for children and young audience. Of course, we'll have also a shop and a bookstore. Uh, and our aim now is to have, or our budget is to have 500,000 visitors uh, annually. Uh, but our dream is to have uh, one million and even even more. So we think that would be possible to have a million. How, how many inhabitants? Uh, Oslo is 650,000 inhabitants. Uh, it's just like uh, Amsterdam, in fact. And the Van Gogh Museum has 2.3 million visitors every year. So we think it should be possible to have one million, <laughs> at least. But they are doing a fantastic job, so they are really wonderful. No, no. Okay, so all the exhibition spaces are different. It's 11. This is one of the monumental uh, uh, spaces where you can see some of Monk's very big works. This is Alma Mater, and uh, sometimes called the uh, researchers, because when Monk was talking about research, he was not talking about professors and academics, but he was talking about children. Uh, and then there is a concert hall that can take uh, 500 people. And seen from another aspect, it's going to be artist talks and uh, curator talks and uh, seminars and like this. And of course, concerts and performances and all kinds of activities. And we can also serve food in this area for 350 people. It's a small cinema, uh, which can be closed like this. Uh, and also there is uh, some spaces uh, on the 12th and 13th floor where we have also possibilities to have concerts and conferences, uh, smaller uh, arrangements and also some wonderful meeting uh, spaces for our visitors. And this is uh, our cafe on the first floor, which will have an outdoor restaurant in the summer. Uh, and here we have some more images uh, of different aspects. And as you see, there is uh, a lot of floors that we can use also for interactivity. So if you have been, for example, to Tate, you see that they use all these uh, different floors to, to do interactive activities or just have people sitting down and reflecting or relaxing. Uh, and then we have this uh, restaurant on the 12th floor with a veranda to the west and a veranda to the, to the east. So uh, this is to the west actually and the other one was to the, to the east. And the west is the sunny side, so that's why it's bigger. Uh, this is on the 12th floor and you can walk up to the bar in the 13th floor if you walk up the steps that you see behind there. And that was what I was going to say about uh, this, but if you have the time, we could show three minutes of the animation to give you an impression of, uh, of uh, what, what it will be, how it will be to, to go there. I hope you will all visit us in one year's time. Let's see if I can get this to... So 
as we had it before. Doesn't stop either. There is a. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I'm sorry for this. So, uh, so we try to resolve the technical problem, but it's already very impressive uh, what we just saw. Ah, it arrives. It's only three minutes, so it just gives you a little bit uh, feeling of how it will be at the new site in Oslo. You see all the water, so it's just on the waterfront. Uh, and this is uh, where we have the entrance area coming in from the north. It's very close also to the central uh, railway station in Oslo, which is it's a very central and also very new part of uh, Oslo. This is the first floor where you have uh, also you see which steps up to the concert hall. You can see uh, the height of the building through this uh, glass. And all the transportation is by escalator, by lifts and uh, steps. And you can see into the library, which it will be a research library that will be open to the, to the public. And of course, uh, the exhibitions won't look like this, but, uh, but you have a little bit also feeling of how that will be. So in fact the exhibition space is five times bigger than what we have today, uh, but the wall space is. So we are just finishing the building right now, we are going to use one year to move in and to train everything and train all the people, and then we open in May uh, next year and of course uh, you are very welcome. Now we look uh, from the 12th floor down to the opera. Storage, we have everything in, in the building. Uh, it's going on the water. <laughs> no, there has been some concern about uh, the water, but uh, the storage is in several floors. I think the first floor you'll find the storage will be the fifth floor. And then fifth, uh, eighth. Uh, yeah. Conservation department uh, also in the seventh. So you'll have the storage in the middle of the museum, basically. It's from water to the first level of, of uh, art will be more than eight meters. But in fact, as you might not know, uh, the water in the north part of the world is not raising, the land is raising. Here is on the first floor again, and you can look into our uh, administration. Here is our administration, and we go into the to the concert uh, and uh, multi-purpose hall. And then we are going out on the north side and, and uh, leaving the museum by the fjord. Of course this is an animation, but I could have made this almost uh, with, with the real museum now, because it looks like this at the moment. So it's just finished with the, with the facade and, and the outside of the museum. So it's very exciting times for us, but we feel that we have planned very well. So. We know something unexpected will happen, but uh, at the moment we feel quite confident that this is going to be a big success. Uh, before talking on the on the content of the museum of the of the new policy of exhibition, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit or to ask you for the 
yeah for the for the yeah for the birth of the of this new museum because uh, it's it's really a, a real change of a real swift of a, uh, for from the from the other the first museum which is quite small you see you maybe you you saw the images it's very intimate uh, on a very human scale a little bit old-fashioned i have to say but it's it's very yeah moving inside uh, because it's it's a very different museum from from what you know in uh, in other countries and it's because it's a quite modest museum but now it's it's really you have 13 floors and um, and i remember that there was uh, quite a lot of discussion around the museum and it took a lot of lo long time to 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 have accepted the project and maybe you can uh, yeah you can talk a little bit on this uh, uh, yeah, on the controversy or, or the discussion who happened in Oslo, uh, and because it's not only a shift in scale, it's it's uh, also a shift in this town, because the old museum is in in Toyen in a more uh, in in a, in a, in a neighbor sh neighbor uh, neighborhood which is maybe less uh, prestigious uh, and it's more. Uh, social uh, problem so it's another uh, neighborhood you will all, uh, you will find here in oslo so maybe you can talk a little bit on this yes and uh, since i came to the museum there's been two major uh, controversies uh, one was to move uh, the collection from this uh, kind of remote part of uh, the city to to the waterfront uh, and to build a new museum in other words, close down the old museum. Uh, and the old museum has been there for almost 60 years, so a lot of people have had very strong experiences and uh, have a strong attachment to the old museum, so they were very resistant to, to move uh, and to close down the old museum to build a new one. Uh, and the new museum was very controversial. First of all, the Spanish architecture didn't actually resonate to uh, the Norwegian uh, population. Uh, and there has never been a vertical museum in Norway before, so a lot of people said you cannot have a vertical museum. Uh, of course, if you have traveled around a bit, you know that uh, Tate uh, is a vertical, Centre Pompidou is uh, basically vertical, uh, MoMA is vertical, uh, but this is the first uh, example in Norway. And then, of course, the escalators was controversial, uh, the architecture was controversial, and the new site was controversial, so we had all these discussions. A lot of people were engaged in these uh, discussions and I think that was very positive even if it was a lot of negative comments because it was uh, uh, so apparent that we were going to build a new museum and uh, that everybody will had a relation to it and I think the opera was also very controversial and a lot of cultural buildings are controversial because you use uh, public money to invest in art and some people don't like that so that's another aspect but uh, when it's built uh, today, everybody is proud of the opera, and they forgot that they were against it, and that's going to happen with the new Munch Museum as well. So I think the controversy with moving and the architecture and how we organize the new museum is going to disappear. The other, maybe more important controversy, was uh, our, our change of uh, exhibition policy, because the Munch Museum was basically not visited by uh, by Norwegians. Uh, it was a tourist place, and uh, it only had 15,000 uh, local visitors every year. And we, we saw that if you look at the Van Gogh Museum, when I came to the Munch Museum, they had uh, their Amsterdam people, which is also 650, basically, thousand. Every three and a half year, in average, they visited the Van Gogh Museum, quite frequently. In Oslo, the Oslo people use the Munch Museum every 35 years, in average. That's twice in your lifetime. So that's when you are in school and some people drag you in. And the second time is when you have visitors from France or America to show this, uh, this uh, famous artist. So that was a sense of urgency. We had to do something with that. So, so the other controversy was to, to re-establish the Munch Museum from a mausoleum uh, to the art museum and to re-enliven and live in, uh, to recreate Munch as an artist because Munch was looked upon as an like historical object. He was an icon. So people came there to see part of their history. 
part of their identity, part of culture, if you like, but not as an artist. So they didn't see Munch as art. They saw the screen, but didn't reflect on what was the Munch's intentions. So we had to re-design uh, or re re live in uh, Edvard Munch. And how did we do that? That was to put him up to other, uh, other artists. So we started with a very controversial uh, Norwegian artist uh, called Melgord. He was uh, staying in New York. Uh, he's, uh, he's a gay artist and his uh, thematics are very controversial. Uh, and we put uh, his works into the Munch Museum besides Edvard Munch and people were furious because how could we drag this uh, artist into the Munch Museum that was a holy chapel of uh, iconic artists that was like a religious place and now we were ruining everything. Uh, but of course uh, Munch was very controversial as well. Uh, so now people were starting to look into some of the works like puberty uh, and to see exactly what Munch was trying to show us. And now I'm not talking about the international audience, I'm talking about the local audience that took Munch for granted. So what we did was to change the whole policy of how we display Munch, how we put Munch up against other artists to show his relevance today and to show that he's still a relevant artist and his uh, thematics, his uh, themes, uh, his subjects are uh, important and uh, relevant not only to visitors from abroad but also to us living in, in Norway today. So that was the second very big uh, controversy. So when we started to do contemporary art and we also invited other artists, for example, we did follow up with the wonderful exhibition in Paris that was Le Modern. Uh, so Munch used the photography and, and filming uh, quite a lot, actually, and that was shown in this uh, show in, in Paris with Angela Lampe as the curator. But then we invited uh, Robert Maplethorpe uh, as a photographer, also very controversial in, in uh, some environments. Uh, and we showed Munch's uh, work uh, as a photographer uh, together with uh, Maplethorpe. And again, people saw his works in a different light. And that uh, made uh, our artist into a more relevant uh, artist uh, in contemporary environment in Norway, but also in a more contemporary sense uh, for, for visitors outside of Norway. Uh, and, of course, we followed up by doing art outside of the museum. For example, today we have an exhibition in one of the hotels in the center of Oslo. We have a small exhibition at the airport. We have a huge exhibition on uh, some of the cruise ships. Uh, we have now, I think, 10 cruise ships that are profiled by Edvard Munch with, with uh, original art and with catalogs and where all the visitors to these boats or ships uh, can experience Munch while they're traveling. So we're doing a lot of work, which is um, not so controversial, maybe, but uh, very different from the original way of uh, running an art museum. So to be outside of the museum and to open the museum to the to the public, and not close ourselves uh, and doing our own kind of projects and invite people in, we try to to work with people in a, in a relationship. And I think that uh, when I came to the Mop Museum, a lot of people there they were thinking that they were working with uh, exhibitions, working with catalogues, working with research, but they had forgotten that they actually worked with people. What you do at the museum is that you work with people, not the employees, that's also people, you work with them, but you work with the visitors uh, and the audience, the society around you. And today, later on, at uh, 3.30, we're going to have a discussion here about uh, the role, the position of an art museum in contemporary society and society development. Uh, which I'm also participating in. So I'm not going to say more now, but I think that museums has to be part of the development of society and uh, be concerned with society's main issues, main challenges. Uh, and that's what we, we did. And that was very controversial because a lot of people liked to have a nice, uh, not difficult artist as Edvard Munch so that you could uh, just have a nice time going to the museum, have a cup of coffee, uh, and have a nice time with their friends, but not actually being uh, involved in the art as uh, such, and not being involved in uh, all the aspects that uh, Munch was uh, concerned with, which is not necessarily nice, which is not uh, necessarily something uh, of, uh, of entertainment, but uh, which is something that makes you reflect and gives you maybe more knowledge about uh, certain uh, things and 
hopefully also about yourself. And could you tell tell more about the plans for the for the for the program in, in the new museum? So it's 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 Munch uh, plus uh, other artists like the model of you you co just told just explained on 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 Melgard and and Munch. So are there other artists or is this will always uh, around Munch? But always I say this because. You just um, uh, mentioned the the idea of uh, the idea of uh, the, the topic of a mono artistic museum. So you you uh, mentioned the Van Gogh Museum, but I know quite well the Paul Klee uh, Centrum in in Bern. Uh, here in Paris, we know the Picasso Museum. We know the Musée Rodin. Uh, so it's a quite yeah a special approach compared to the Centre Pompidou, the Musée National d'Art Moderne, where we have a lot of artists, but there you have all the all only one even if it's a genius, uh, but you have always, uh, I don't know if it's a limit or um, how you, uh, yeah, how you will deal with this uh, oeuvre and uh, in, in Bern, for example, they, uh, they will, they show other artists, but they are the other artists who are linked to the universe of Paul Klee. So like, for example, in, f in, o in for or for they will, um, they will show a uh, present a show on Bauhaus, uh, and or they will they had a show with Emil Nolde, uh, so artist uh, of the Paul Klee's universe. Uh, and here in Paris, so we know the Musée Picasso. They are organizing uh, exhibition together with other institutions, and they show it in the space uh, in the of these other other museums. So uh, how you will conceive your program for the new museum? Yeah, thank you for, for asking that. Um, I think uh, the change of programming at the old museum is going to be reflected uh, in how we wanted to develop the new museum. So what we are going to do there is to use uh, a lot of the space to show a modern display of Edward Munch in, in a variety of, uh, of expressions with paintings, graphics, uh, drawings, uh, watercolors, uh, sculptures and so forth. Uh, and that will be kind of a semi-permanent uh, exhibition. Uh, and then we'll have a strong uh, two-floor uh, contemporary art program. So that will consist on several series. Uh, we have a, something called the Edward Munch Art Award that is given to a young, uh, talented uh, um, uh, artist, uh, international. And the first uh, winner of the Edward Munch Art Award was in fact uh, French. Camille Arrault uh, from Paris, living in uh, in New York, I think. But she was uh, the first winner. And then uh, there was a German, uh, Catherine Brecht, that was the second winner. But all the winners of the Edward Munch Art Award will be shown with a huge uh, monographic exhibition in the new museum. Uh, and then we have uh, going to have a triennale. Every third year is going to a lot of uh, new works, uh, international also. So it's going to be a lot of uh, contemporary art uh, connected to this museum. And then we can also use uh, our possibility as a big collection to ask uh, other museums to give us works so that we can show international art from almost everything, uh, almost every museum. So when we have an exhibition outside of our museum, we always ask to have something back. So for example, from the Centre Pompidou now, they are participating in an exhibition in the new Munch Museum to be open next fall, which is called Symbolism Surrealism, uh, with 350 works from all over the world. Uh, to show Munch as a surrealist and symbolist. Uh, he's known as a symbolist, not so much as a surrealist. And um, and uh, in this case, we can do like like to do at uh, the Picasso or Rodin, but we are going to do it very wide. So we are going to, for example, now we have uh, two exhibitions in China. Uh, and what we do uh, in Norway is to show uh, Chinese paintings, which is kind of related in many ways. Uh, and uh, and we can show how the relationship between Chinese painting from uh, 300 years before Christ to up to today. And uh, we discovered that Munch has a very big impact in China, in contemporary Chinese uh, art, which we weren't aware of, so we are studying that now. Uh, but for example, now with the graphic exhibition that we're having in the British Museum in London, uh, from them we are getting back works from the from the history of printing, uh, so we're going to show Munk in a historic context that shows we don't need to show Munk only with the modernists or contemporary artists. We can also show him with with older artists uh, like uh, Durer or, uh, 
or other really famous uh, paintings in, in printing. So we can show Munch in that kind of printing context because Munch is also a very uh, modern printmaker. And in fact, his first, I think when he was first discovered uh, internationally, it was through his uh, research and development of the printing uh, techniques. So, uh, so we can do a wide repertoire of uh, something we call like blockbuster exhibitions, which will hopefully make more people interested in art and can draw a wider uh, audience to our museum. So in addition to Munch and contemporary art, we're also going to do uh, this uh, blockbuster uh, events. For example, three years ago, we did, a contemporary, we did a collaboration with the Van Gogh Museum. So we did a Munch Van Gogh exhibition in Oslo, uh, which also went to, to Amsterdam. And now it's going to Japan. Uh, but we, if, and that was in the old museum. Uh, but of course, if we did Van Gogh in a new museum, that might be just a Van Gogh exhibition because we already have 60% of our exhibition spaces with Munch. We don't need to have Munch in the, in the blockbuster kind of uh, exhibitions, but sometimes we can put in Munch as a reference works to certain uh, exhibitions, like the symbolist, uh, surrealist exhibition, of course, we'll also have Munch presented together with a wide range of other artists in that uh, field. So it's going to be uh, a very uh, different art programs from what we have today. In addition to that, we are going to have the museum open from 10 to 10, uh, and the restaurants even longer. Uh, and maybe we are having a nightclub on the top, top floor uh, sometimes. Uh, but it's going to be a program every night of, uh, of music, of uh, performances, of uh, artist talks, uh, curator talks, uh, seminars, uh, research programs, and all kinds of activities. So it's going to be something happening also every night, which is more temporary, maybe one day or two day experiences. And we have a lot of collaborators. For example, we are just by the opera. We are now uh, going to do uh, some opera programs together. There are a lot of uh, visual artists that has done scenography and, uh, and uh, design and the costumes, for example, uh, and that can be combined to, to what we are doing. So we're going to do a lot of uh, collaboration with other art institutions uh, in Oslo and outside of Norway. So it's going to be a very wide program also happening outside of the museum. Apropos other cooperation, because there is uh, uh, as well a new building for the National Gallery of Art in Oslo. I don't know when will it open? I think next year as well? Or? Yes, the new National Museum will open uh, in October, we, we believe, uh, next year. So it's only a few months after the new Munch Museum is opening, so it's a totally new time for the, for the city of Oslo when it comes to, to art uh, possibilities and art infrastructure, to use a boring word, but art institutions is going to develop with, uh, with new buildings and much bigger buildings than what we have before and, and with a lot more exhibition spaces. Are you uh, planning to, to cooperate with the National Art Gallery? I remember you made a show on the uh, Munch's uh, 150th anniversary uh, in 2013. And because maybe not everybody knows here, because the National Gallery of Art has as well a, a Munch collection. Uh, of course, less than at the Munch Museum, but they have... Uh, uh, yeah, the f one was the finest painting in the, in the collection, and one another version, first version of the screen, of the screen, and others, of course. Sorry <laughs> to say, no. It's only to say um, if there a cooperation or if this is a sort of a competition or how how will it work? Uh, because you have two major museums with brand new buildings in Oslo uh, starting from next year. Yes, we do a lot of collaboration with the National Museum. We did this huge uh, anniversary together. Uh, it's not the first version of the screen, by the way. I just want to underline that. Uh, there are many, many versions of the screen. Uh, and the first is a drawing. But anyway, uh, we are doing uh, collaboration with uh, some of the museums in Oslo on an ad hoc basis. But there is four quite big museums in Oslo. One is a private museum, Astrup Fernley. Uh, with a private collection, it's a contemporary program, and then there is something called Henny Unsta, which is also a almost private uh, museum with a huge collection of uh, modernism, and then there is us with the Munch Museum and the National Museum. So all four of us is uh, frequently talking together and and uh, doing a collaboration on uh, certain aspects, and maybe in the future we'll do a festival together or do other activities that will also be more. Uh, artistic, but uh, we have a very good dialogue and uh, sometimes we 
participate in each other's uh, exhibitions uh, and uh, we work together in order to to raise the awareness and importance of art in in Norway and, and art in general so uh, so it's uh, it's a good collaboration uh, and it's also going to be a good uh, competition of course uh, and I think that uh, that in the future we can uh, can do a lot of things also uh, together that will be uh, creating Oslo into a very interesting uh, space to visit if you are interested in art. And do you will keep on on organizing the exhibition abroad, uh, so as in Saudi Arabia or in Russia, so uh, uh, parallel to the new museum because you have to more space and you have to show more pa uh, monk paintings so uh, because I, I'm asking because we know in our place at some point we do we are uh, as well as uh, organizing shows abroad and the, we will just about to to open a, a new branch in in Shanghai we just opened in Belgium in Malaga so then sometimes we are yeah it's a sort of I don't know quarreling but discussion on uh, which work uh, which painting we will show in which place and it's a very difficult organization to 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 manage the different loans and and so how you will organize be uh, this even if you have I don't know. I don't remember the number of paintings, but uh, to have the, the 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 icons and the major paintings, uh, uh, you will keep them in Oslo, or they will on keep on and touring shows abroad. How you will deal with this? I will certainly going to to have uh, shows internationally, and we can do more shows internationally now because the 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 difficulty uh, with international uh, or um, exhibitions outside of the Munch Museum today is not the number of works, it's the number of uh, people working in conservation because it's a lot of conservation when you have loans uh, and Munch, uh, let's say, unfortunately was doing his works on very fragile uh, technologies uh, so a lot of things is paperwork, for example the some of the screen versions are on the cardboard which is crumbling, so it's very, very difficult, and a lot of paperwork, uh, and uh, we really need to pay attention to that, and that's why the difficulty today is uh, how, ma how much capacity you have in the conservation department. In the new museum, we're going to have four times more capacity in the, in the conservation department, so we can do a lot more exhibitions. And uh, on top of the 1150 uh, paintings that we have. We also have 8,000 drawings by Edvard Munch, which is not very much known. We have wonderful uh, aquarelles by Edvard Munch that hasn't been shown around the world either. Uh, and we have 18,000 graphic works, uh, which uh, 300 of those is now in London. But of course, we could spread them all over the world if we wanted to. Uh, and we have other things like photography and films and sculptures. Uh, and a lot of documentation uh, material. So what we are going to do is to have an extended uh, activity uh, when we get into the new museum. We can always fill our own museum with, with Munk, but we will also like to enrich the lives of people all over the world, I mentioned earlier, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to have an extensive international activity. And we have also looked into the possibility of satellites, um, but the problem with satellite is that you are only in one place, uh, so, so far we have decided to to move around and to do exhibitions. We receive about 60 invitations every year from major museums all over the world that wants to have MOOC exhibition. 60, 60, yeah. So it's a lot of possibilities. So what we do is to look into which museums are most important to present MOOC, like the Metropolitan, like the Centre Pompidou, like the Tate, uh, like the National Museum of China, that kind of thing. Uh, or like now, the Tretyakov Museum in Moscow, if you go there, it's a really, really fantastic uh, museum, it's a national museum of Russia. And, um, and then we look into museums that can give us something back that would be interesting to show in Oslo. And of course, we also have very nice uh, income from international activity, so that's another aspect. But uh, to answer kind of bluntly, the, the activity international will be uh, be even stronger and even more active than it has been in the past. So right now, we have four or five major exhibitions internationally at the same time and that's going to be also the situation in the future and uh, even um, even extended so the, i think the last question so you're not afraid of an monk overkill of too many too much monk in the world or uh, you're still optimistic about the future of monks uh, i am a little bit uh, anxious about that actually 
Uh, every year there is between 20 and 30,000 articles of Edvard Munch worldwide. So it's an enormous attention. Uh, 30,000 articles of uh, Munch uh, every year worldwide is five times more than Norway. So uh, can it last? I'm not sure, but when we have 690,000 people in, uh, in Japan in three months and the Japanese people ask, when are you coming back? Uh, and now in Moscow, the, the exhibition was sold out before it opened. Uh, and the Russians are really very sad that we cannot continue having the exhibition there for more for several other months. Uh, so I think there is a lot of uh, people that uh, want to experience Munch that ha doesn't have the possibility yet. Uh, and we know that Munch is also very, very popular in China. There is a lot of people in China. Uh, and, uh, and to reach them, we are doing also a lot of other things. For example, the digitalization I mentioned earlier. We are going to do exhibitions that are digital, uh, with not uh, original works, but only digital kinds of experiences, not necessarily uh, on a digital basis, but also in physical spaces, uh, which is happening now. To uh, Let's say you have in, in, uh, in Paris uh, the Van Gogh exhibition at the uh, Galerie Lumière, which is an example of what you can do uh, digitally, but uh, there is a lot of possibilities digitally in, uh, in virtual re reality or in uh, artificial intelligence and in all kinds of other possibilities. So we want to reach out to people all over the world and I'm not afraid at the moment that we will use uh, and, uh, and use uh, Munch uh, to an extent that uh, his relevance will be diminished, but we have to keep an eye on that uh, certainly. Okay, so the last work we have to keep an eye on it also thank you for for this for this talk and thank you for your attention yes and thank you so much thank you angela thank you very much very nice being here yes, thank you very much. any question from the room okay um so um Yes, I have a question actually. Um, so, um, uh, I am. Um, um, what kind of role uh, the new museum will have in uh, education in history of art in Norway? Because I spent one year in Norway, I visited twice the um, Munch Museum. Uh, it was really awesome. Uh, but yeah, I was only with uh, foreign people, and I. I haven't seen a lot of Norwegian people in the museum, so I want to know what kind of role you want to have for Norwegian people, for art for Norwegian people. Yeah, again, thank you for asking, because uh, we are developing uh, an educational department now. Uh, we didn't have one when I came, and now we have maybe seven or eight people. It's going to be at least twice as much. But I can tell you that we have a lot of uh, digital projects uh, reaching out to the Z generation, which doesn't actually w look at very many things uh, physically. And we're doing a program to reach out to all the kids in school, for example. And the thing we are doing in that, in that context... Are you okay? <laughs> uh, because uh, Munch was very related to the spaces that he were living in and working in. Uh, so he's using his spaces as not only scenography, but also like uh, psychology and, uh, and art. And we are trying to give the kids all over the Norway, for example, and we're going to extend that into other languages. But to take one example, we're going to teach the kids how they can use their uh, surroundings and their landscapes uh, to express themselves uh, emotionally or, uh, or in other uh, aspects. So that's one thing we are doing. But we are really now developing educational work and, and the teaching at the Munch Museum to reach uh, new audiences uh, all over the world. Uh, and of course, also developing project uh, that uh, kids can, can um, and other audiences can, can see work uh, directly and physically live. Uh, so today we have 22,000 kids at the Munch Museum and they're all working with art when they're visiting us. But that, that's the capacity we have. Uh, in the new museum, we are having wonderful uh, uh, workshops for kids, and we can have uh, as many kids as want to come to us. It's going to be at least maybe four, three or four times more kids coming to the museum because there's a lot of kids that wants to go to the museum today that cannot get in because we don't have the capacity. So, so thank you for asking. This is very important. 
uh, and of course we want to to develop more art interest in uh, in our country and we have to work with the kids and and the young grown-ups and uh, of course also the rest of different groups thank you A last question? Okay, a quick question. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh, so ju just very uh, two short questions. Uh, what will you do with uh, old museum? And also you were speaking about uh, this group of monographical museums that you are part of. And can you talk a bit more about it? Um, thank you. The old museum will be taken over by the National Theatre and be a, a kind of a local theatre for for the population in that part of town. I think that's much better than the museum for, for city development. So I'm very happy with that. Is there going to be a, a, a local uh, theatre? Uh, and now they're rebuilding their, their, their old building, so they're going to do their main productions also in this site in the, in the years to come, the first three or four years. And then it's going to be a, a community theater. So that's very nice. Uh, we established actually at the MOOC Museum in 2014 the network of single artist museums. And now it's almost 30 museums participating. And the precondition to get into this uh, network is that you have a museum and a collection. And you have a single artist. Uh, and you have research and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, what do you call it, uh, documentary material archives. Uh, and we meet uh, one or two times a year, uh, not only on the director level, but also, for example, the, the main uh, curators can meet together or the marketing people can meet together and to have this network to develop best practices and to see how we can deal with a lot of aspects that we deal with as single artist museum. That is not the same questions necessarily as the encyclopedic museums or the museums that is, has a much wider collection and doesn't have a responsibility to one single artist. But we have to take a responsibility to our artists. So we have to not only do research on Edward Munch, but we have to inspire research uh, on Edward Munch all over the world. And when I came to the museum, there was another reflection I made and that was that uh, we have another artist in Norway, Henrik Ibsen, who is, a, who is a dramatist. And there is 180 doctorates on, uh, on Ibsen, but only 11 uh, on Munch. Now it's 13, but it's a, it's a very small number. So we need to inspire research, uh, not only in our museum, but also around the world. And I'm very happy that uh, Angela here is, uh, is a PhD, uh, also an expert on Munch. But, uh, but that's, uh, of course, uh, a very interesting network for us. And it consists of the, uh, of the Museum of uh, Picasso in, in Paris. And in fact, uh, they're yeah, uh, not only part of the group, but we have a steering committee. And uh, Laurent Lebon, who is the director of the Picasso Museum, he's one of four people in the steering committee for this network. I'm one of them as well. And we have the Miro Museum, the Clay Museum, the Salvador Dali Museum in Florida, uh, quite a number of American museums actually, and uh, also European museums. Uh, so so uh, there are three uh, Picasso museums, uh, Malaga uh, is also one. Uh, so uh, so you can look into this on, on the website. We don't have a specific uh, website for this network, it's coming. Uh, and we also have uh, made a manifest for single artist museums. And there is actually now some uh, researchers that are dealing, going deeper into what is the challenges of single artist museums that is different from, from the other museums. So we are getting a lot more knowledge now on how to deal with running uh, these museums. Of course, there is a lot of things going to, we, when, you, when you go into themes like royalty, uh, if you want to to be a museum that will give um, uh, opinions on, uh, on the validity of, uh, of uh, art. For example, people come to us with uh, artworks and they say, is this a monk? And the Van Gogh Museum, they say yes or no, or maybe we say we don't have any opinion uh, because it's so many legal issues. If you say no and you're mistaken, if you say yes or you're mistaken, it's a big problem. Uh, so we don't do that, they do that. The Clay Museum has big problems now because they did it, now they stop. So we have all these issues that we can discuss, which is uh, very important for us to have a, let's say, 
uh, a policy that is uh, understood and it's uh, wide and general. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Je vous souhaite une très bonne journée. Thank you very much. I wish you a, ha a very nice day at Fontainebleau.